Okay, welcome back, Chemistry 241. We've got our last lecture handout for our unit. Uh, we've got our exam, really, really important. Our exam is on Wednesday morning uh, this week, so make sure you're aware of that because missing it would be a very bad move. Uh, we've uh, taken your uh, survey feedback and we decided to open it up and be as generous as we could, so we're gonna make the exam available from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Again, 3 p.m. is the absolute deadline, so if you're not done by 3 p.m., that's just too bad. You're gonna get some late points taken off and you're gonna have to find some way to contact us because that's, that's just not a good situation. So make sure you get up in plenty of time to make sure you complete that exam between nine and three. Um, the exam will be about an hour and 15 minutes of working time plus a good 15 minutes of time devoted to allow you to scan and upload your answers. So roughly it's an hour and 30 minutes at your disposal. Um, so again, you got to start early enough to be totally done by three o'clock. So no excuses. Um, you know, I'll post an announcement on Canvas so you know what's going on and have it in writing so you can take a look. But uh, this is really important, you know, and the format's gonna be very much the same as our timed quizzes. So make sure you're, you're good to go. Um, we'll talk more about that during the review sessions on Monday. Uh, so make sure you check out. Dr. Cook will be offering one from noon to one, and I will follow up with one from 1.30 to 2.30. So that way we cover both parts of the uh, exam three unit. Uh, today, um, we're gonna talk about nanotechnology. It's kind of a nice way of um, sharing something pretty cool with you here at the end. And the good news is for you, for many of you that are maybe worried about the exam, I've decided that I'm gonna put the bulk of this material on the um, literature and video lab activity for the week. So as you can see here from the um, bullet points, the be able to's, um, you know, very little you know, uh, of this material will be on the exam. Uh, so don't worry about this so much for the exam. Um, this will be covered mainly in the, um, the lab activity for the week. However, note that it will be fair game for the final exam. So make sure that you don't lose this handout. You put it somewhere safe so that you're, you're good to go. Okay, so today what I really wanna do, um, nanotechnology and nanoscience obviously are two really big areas of research and study. And there's just no way we can cover this in, in 40 minutes or so. It's just not gonna happen. So what I thought I'd do instead is give you a little bit of a tour of some of the areas I think are most important, maybe talk a little bit about the history, a little bit about science versus technology, and then finally end with perhaps a little bit about the public perception of what nanotechnology is and maybe some future directions. So make sure you do you did your reading and um, you know um, you looked at a couple of those videos that I posted because I think they're really pretty um, important because they can tell you kind of where this stuff is going to go. And again, you know, um, this is an area of really cool research. So I hope maybe on your spare time, in your spare time, you might look up a, a nanotech uh, research article or two on your own time, just if you're interested. But if not, no big deal. We'll go ahead and get uh, the key points here and move along. Okay. So the first thing I'd like to do um, before we jump into the actual details of nanotechnology is to maybe zoom back out a little bit and think about what is science versus technology? And this is something you might, I don't know, you might have thought about. Technology and engineering here I'm gonna use interchangeably, so forgive me if, if that's a little bit annoying, but science really differs from technology and engineering, and that's, that's really important because science typically is gonna impact what? Well, science is gonna look at the underlying what? It's gonna look at the underlying principles and behaviors, right? So in science, we're looking at how, you know, elements and compounds behave, right? Um, what are the trends in reactivity? Um, what are the ways in which orbitals interact to form bonds? How do we treat electrons as particles, as waves, as both, as neither? Um, you know, what does bonding look like in a molecule? How, how does energy transfer in a chemical reaction? All these kinds of things are looking at fundamental, right? Fundamental um, discovery of knowledge. And that's, I think, a really key distinction. If you're gonna look at technology, right? Technology and engineering, that's gonna be the um, application, right? The application of science and those underlying principles to essentially make devices or structures or 
ways of building that can impact society, hopefully in a very positive way. So there's a really key distinction there between the science and the technology. Now, granted, that's a really short, just really super superficial explanation, but it's a pretty good one. And so you may go on and, and get more detailed if you take like the philosophy of science or, or an engineering course, everybody may have their own opinion. But for right now, that's a pretty safe distinction between science and technology. The reason I bring this up is because oftentimes people will use nanotechnology as a term to describe everything that people talk about within the realm of this topic. However, I want to make sure that we talk about um, not only the applications, which would be the nanotechnology or the nano engineering, but also thinking about the fundamental understandings of the behaviors, the principles, the rules governing the way these systems act. Um, that would be what I would call the nanoscience, right? Which is, I think, really what we're going to perhaps um, focus on just as much. Okay, so if you think about why we would care about this idea of nanotechnology, I think it's important to get a little bit of a perspective on what size uh, scale we're dealing with, right? And if you are paying attention, we're talking about nanoscience, nanotechnology, so the prefix nano is quite important. And you need to recall that, right, nano means 10 to the negative ninth, right? And my screen just moved, there we go, let's bring it back. Um, so 10 to negative ninth, right? So it takes 1 billion nanometers to equal one meter. That is just an insanely large number. As human beings, I don't think we can really even uh, visualize something that large. I mean, what does that mean to have 1 billion of something? Well, you know, there's nothing in our experience that really allows us to think about that. Now, maybe as chemists, we're a little bit better off because we can think about maybe you know, we know there's a mole of water molecules in 18 milliliters, right? We can kind of get some idea, but still a number that large is, is, is pretty much outside of our, 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 our life experience. And so I'd like to maybe put it into context. And so we're dealing with things that are really small if we're thinking about nanometer. And the field itself has kind of um, agreed upon a, a rough definition that nanoscience and nanotechnology is going to focus on materials that are somewhere within the one to 100 nanometer range. And so what's important about that range? Well, here's a, a ruler that I kind of stole from a, um, a website that I thought was really good. I should probably go in and find a reference for that. Apologies for that. But if you think about, you know, things that are on our scale, like tennis balls and pencils and things like that, there, there are huge numbers of nanometers, right? It's, it's, it's a joke. And so as we get down, if we kind of go smaller and smaller in scale, we start to think about biological systems in terms of cells, bacteria, right? Really important. And then we get to this one to 100 nanometer scale. And what do we have here? We have viruses, we have large biomolecules, right? Like DNA is, I think, roughly about five nanometers uh, double double stranded DNA is about five nanometers in the helical uh, width. Uh, glucose, we're talking about molecules, right? Small molecules, we're talking about big molecules like proteins and enzymes, antibodies, right? Oligonucleotides, chromosomes, things like that, right? And many of these are naturally occurring. Um, and and if you think about, we can have synthetic materials that we can make now. We can make C60, right? And I think that's about one uh, nanometer um, wide, about maybe about a half, maybe I'm wrong there. Dendromers, which is these kind of branch compounds, quantum dots and nanoparticles and oxide nanoparticles. We're gonna talk a lot about these kind of nanoparticles that can range between one and 100 nanometers. And then polymers that we can make and liposomes, all kinds of crazy things. And again, this is just a really small set of things. If you go out into the literature and read about nanoscience and nanotechnology, you're gonna find a huge spectrum of diverse and significant examples of things that can be uh, really exciting. That's why I urge you to maybe, you know, go look at some of this stuff on your own, It'd be kind of cool. All right, so if that's kind of the definition of where we're looking at and why it's important, why is it important from a fundamental point of view? Well, we find that nanotechnology has the potential to be very, very powerful because one to 100 nanometers ends up being what I would call kind of a Goldilocks zone. What do I mean by that? Well, if you remember the story of Goldilocks and three bears, right, with the, there were the three bowls of porridge, right, and Goldilocks, like, 
you know, broke into their house and caused problems and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, well, one of the pulled bowls of porridge, right, was what, too hot, one of them was too cold, and one was just right. Well, that's kind of my analogy here. Um, if you think about bulk materials, right, so if we look at one nanometer to 100 nanometers, if we go further than that, we end up getting what we call bulk, bulk materials. Bulk materials are going to be things like a chunk of gold, like a bar of gold you can hold in your hand. What does a bar of gold look like? Well, it's kind of yellow, it's metallic looking, it's reflective, um, it's, it's pure gold is, is easy to dent, right? It's not that firm. Um, and so bulk materials, you know what gold looks like. Okay. And you can kind of understand the properties of gold. We've talked about metallic structures and solids and crystals and all of that, right? If you go down past, you know, down here near the one nanometer meter range and smaller, we end up getting into the range of single molecules and atoms. And single molecules and atoms behave in a very certain way. And we've talked about the properties of molecules based on intermolecular forces and all of that kind of stuff. So, but in Chem 111 and in this class, we've kind of covered bulk materials and single molecules or atoms, right? Or small clusters. Now, what happens when you begin to form um, large assemblies of these, or you take bulk materials and you are able to break them down through either uh, chemical processes or whatever, and you can get into this range that we're talking about as nanotech, right? The nanotech region, right? Or nanoscience region. Once you're in this range, things get pretty trippy pretty weird. Properties begin to do all kinds of crazy things and they behave in a way that is really not like bulk materials, nor is it like molecules, single molecules and single atoms. It's this weird kind of quasi zone where all kinds of weird materials and properties can manifest themselves and give us things that you just aren't going to access with bulk materials or single molecules or atoms and it ends up being really cool because when you get those kind of freaky properties you can get really amazing and exotic materials that can do really cool things and so one of the reasons people are really excited about this is because the nano region kind of plays by its own set of rules which opens up a whole new frontier in science because what are we going to do? Science is going to look for ways to map out and find the rules of the game for those materials. Engineers will come along and scientists sometimes do, but they work in the engineering side as well. Um, sometimes engineers do a little bit of science too. I'm not trying to say one is better than the other. I'm just trying to say that they typically have different jobs. The engineer is going to come along typically and they're going to use these properties to build exotic new cool things, right? Like, can you build better concrete? Can you build better water resistant cloth? Can you build electronics that are faster and cheaper than ever before? All kinds of things can happen made possible by these special properties we get only from confining matter in the one nanometer to 100 nanometer scale. And that's really important. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you an example of one. And the first example, I'm gonna give you several examples. The first example I'm gonna give you is by thinking about materials that we can build um, what I will call from uh, the bottom up, right? So I'm gonna talk about the bottom up approach. And what do I mean by that? Bottom up approach. Well, traditionally, um, I don't know how many of you guys have ever done studio art, but if you ever want to go and make a sculpture, right? Odds are you're gonna get a piece of stone and you're gonna to begin to chip away pieces of that stone and you're gonna make a, a sculpture. Or if you're like me and you wanna go into the, the shop, right? And you wanna you know, make something out of wood or make something out of metal, you're gonna go and you're gonna file down uh, a piece of metal uh, with a lathe or you're gonna uh, take a saw or a chisel and you're gonna cut away pieces of wood until you get the structure you want. And essentially what we're doing is we're, we're in a way creating kind of a big chunk of, of a waste, right? Because you're, you're taking this big thing and you're carving away material and, um, you know, that's not the best way to do it. So that's kind of a top-down approach. What we'd like to do instead is be much more efficient. We would like to take, if possible, right, the kind of 
amazing dream of nanotechnology would be to start from the single molecule side instead of starting from the bulk side. And let's you know, use these atoms and molecules as Legos, if you will, and build from the bottom up, build small little assemblies that can come together to make big objects. And that's what we mean by the bottom up. And so the first bottom up approach I'm gonna show you is gold and silver nanoparticles. And what is a gold or silver nanoparticle? Well, essentially what they look like, um, they'll typically be drawn as a cartoon, right? And you may say, okay, well, I'm gonna have my gold nanoparticle. And then oftentimes these are gonna be again in diameter, they're gonna typically be one to a hundred nanometers to fit that nanoscale regime. And then they're gonna be decorated with really cool molecules. And these molecules can be anything from like sodium citrate, um, which I show you here, down here. So here's, you know, we could have a sodium citrate molecule. Um, in this case, it's trisodium uh, citrate, and where you have three sodiums, because uh, citrate, if you look at it, citrate has three um, acid groups, and you can deprotonate those and become anionic formed, and they'll be attracted to sodium. So that's kind of a cool thing. Um, and so here's a, a better cartoon than what I can draw, where you see you have your metal core here, and then you have all of the organic, um, or sometimes inorganic molecules that are gonna be around it um, that decorate that surface. And you might say, well, why do you wanna put things on there? Why don't you just leave it naked? Well, the problem is, if you have these little pieces of gold floating around or silver or whatever material, they can bump into each other. And typically these are made in solution in, in the liquid phase, you know? And so if they bump together, they have a very high affinity for each other. And so these gold particles will bump into each other and they'll just form big globs of gold. And when you get to a certain point, they fall out of solution because what have you made? Well, you've essentially made structures that are too big and they're gonna be uh, bulk materials and you'll just have little, little bits of gold dust at the bottom of your flask. You don't want that. You want them to stay in that one to 100 nanometer range. And the way you do that is you put those organic groups or those molecule groups on uh, the outside, which kind of serves as a cushion, a little bit of a repellent. So when these gold particles and they come together, um, they are repelled from each other and they don't gr group up, which is really important. And so let's let's see how you might um, think about building these gold nanoparticles. And this works for silver, and this is really the the idea of what you're going to be talking about um, in your um, lab uh, research article and your um, video uh, lab for the week. So what you're gonna do is typically you're gonna start with a material. And in this case, you're gonna start with a precursor or starting material or reactant. And if you look at this, we have gold, right? This is our gold source. This is actually called tetrachloroauric acid. Um, you can kind of see where some of that nomenclature comes from. And I intentionally didn't leave it, I left out the oxidation state. So if we think about chloride being negative one and uh, this being a um, complex over here. Um, so we've got four negatives and a proton over here. This is actually, remember again, tetrachloroauric acid. So that's a proton, that's not a hydride. Um, and so in this case, I hope you'll realize that this has to be gold three. Gold three then is reacted in solution, right? So typically this is gonna be an aqueous solution in water, right? And it's gonna be mixed with this sodium citrate. And so uh, one, two, three sodiums, and you've got uh, three acid groups here. It's important to realize that you have your negative charges here, right? That's really important. And this is also gonna be an aqueous solution. And you're gonna mix these together. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a reflux. Remember the reflux? You gotta put some heat energy in. You gotta get these guys reacting, get some collisions going on. And ultimately what's gonna happen is you're gonna get a redox reaction. You're gonna get the gold three getting reduced to gold zero to form the core of our nanoparticle. And then it's gonna be decorated in three dimensions, kind of like the picture up here, right? Decorated by these citrates. And these citrates, uh, these sodium ions are just kind of uh, loosely attracted. They're not really bound in here. Um, but if you think about it, we've got if, you know, the, the actual attraction here is the, um, these groups here that are sort of, you know, if you wanna think about it, they're essentially um, gonna be bound to the surface of the gold through different attractions, right? 
and you can think of it as either a, a metal ligand attraction where maybe the individual atoms on this gold surface, because again, this is really important. This is not one atom, right? This is actually a cluster of, of atoms to make a nanoparticle. And as they nucleate the one atom, two atoms, three, four, they begin to come together and they'll form a little nucleus, a seed crystal, if you will. And then eventually, um, you know, you've kind of got supersaturation and they reach a certain size and th that size can be measured with a variety of things we'll talk about but over time what I'm trying to show you here is that you get a whole bunch of nucleation you form a whole bunch of little tiny particles which then begin to grow over time and you might ask well what determines how big these get well it depends on a couple of things well what is their limiting reagent right how much gold do you put in that will determine how big they can get also how much of this molecule do you put in? Because it can cap and cover up the gold surface so that it can uh, preclude growing past a certain point. Now there's a whole lot of recipes and things that I'm not gonna get into. I've probably already gotten into more detail than you care about. But the idea here is we're using some very simple redox chemistry. We're reducing the gold from gold three uh, to gold zero. And then the, the surface of that gold particle is going to attract these uh, ligand groups and those are gonna be um, on the surface. And you could think about connecting this to the hard soft acid base theory that we talked about before. Here you see you have hydro, uh, I'm sorry, oxygen groups. You might imagine that you could have a group like this, right? You could have, and this is gonna be the focus of one of the papers that, or actually the paper you draw, you read uh, this week. And you could have, I don't know, a large chain, right? Where you have a bunch of CH3 groups. They could be symmetrical. They may not be symmetrical. I will call this M, I don't care. This is called a disulfide. Disulfide. And that's because it has two sulfurs bound together. Now, you can actually break this bond and you can form a thiol, which has a very similar structure. Um, I don't know, I'm running out of, I'll just call that X. And so these are gonna be what? Well, if you have a gold particle, gold remember is a pretty soft metal. So uh, remember hard soft acid base theory, it has actually a pretty good attraction or affinity for sulfur. And so you can actually build a whole toolkit of different molecules that you can bind uh, to the citrate, or sorry, to the gold, uh, as opposed to citrate. Or sometimes you can actually take this gold particle and you can make the gold citrate and then you can switch molecules in and out and make various, uh, what I will call self-assembled monolayers, a SAM, a self-assembled monolayer where you get a single layer, a monolayer of organic molecules or inorganic molecules around the gold surface. And that's something you're gonna read about this week in lab. And it is extremely powerful. Um, there are a number of different things which we'll talk about in a minute, but I would like to mention that um, making gold nanoparticles and silver particles has, has been around for a long, long time. If you go to, uh, there's an article I put about uh, the Romans, you know, this they made beautiful art using, you know, nanotechnology. Of course, they didn't call it that and they didn't know exactly what they were doing. Um, but if you think about it, um, this is a beautiful cup. This is like Serge's cup. Um, you can read about it if you want to. And they use, I think, about 50 nanometer particles. And they generated those particles, I assume, by uh, just milling and grinding these gold um, powders until they got small, small, small little nanoparticles. And they embedded them into glass and into their art. And so one of the most beautiful things about this cup is that depending on how the light strikes it or what fills it, it can be different colors. If you've ever gone to a church, especially the beautiful churches in um, European villages or, or big cities where you know some of these beautiful stained glass windows have been around since medieval times, um, they have those, those artists used gold nanoparticles and silver nanoparticles to make these beautiful red um, structures, especially gold uh, in these church windows. So there's a whole history of using these for various processes. And what I wanted to maybe just mention today was not only how you make them 
and you'll get some more experience on that with your activity for the video lab this week, but also what can they be used for? Um, and so let's just jump ahead. Um, I, I've talked too much about this, so uh, hopefully I left you a lot of room to, to think about that and write some notes. Okay, however, gold and silver are not the only thing that you can make nanoparticles from. You can make, um, obviously, metallic nanoparticles of everything from like iron to copper. I mean, I've seen so many different kinds that you can make nickel, um, titanium, all kinds of things. You can make non-metals, you can make semiconductors, and one of the most amazing set of semiconducting materials you can make are cadmium sulfur sulfide, which is this one, and cadmium selenide. And these materials are amazing because um, even more vibrant than the gold nanoparticles, the color of these materials is dictated by roughly the size of the electron cloud, right? And so Something really special special happens when you confine these electron clouds on these small little particles, and if they have certain um, you know orientations related to the bonding, you can get these beautiful colors. And here you can see an example I looked up for you. If you want to, you can go look up this paper. Um, but if you can start with the two nanometer particles, if you keep them really small, they end up looking blue. And as the radius or the diameter of the particle gets bigger and bigger and bigger, they begin to shift down to red. And it's all because of the way the visible light interacts with the fluctuations of that electron cloud within that very small particle range. And it's really, really beautiful. The other thing that's really neat about these uh, materials is that what you're looking at in these pictures is not actually the absorbance. You're looking at what happens when you turn light off, uh, the, the room light off. These things actually glow, they fluoresce. And how does that happen? Well. If you hit them with ultraviolet light, they will actually absorb that light and emit a new light in a different color uh, based on the structure and the diameter. And here you are, you're actually seeing that uh, two nanometer particles actually emit a blue light, whereas eight nanometer particles emit a red light. And they're just, just beautiful particles. I, I strongly urge you to do, so, do a Google search and go check these out on your own, but it's, it's just amazing materials. You can use them for electronics, and some people are using maybe not these exact materials, but they're using very similar materials to develop new hard drives to store data um, much more densely, so you can get more data in a smaller hard drive, all kinds of amazing things. And then the other thing they're doing is they're using these materials to fight cancer. And one way you can do that is you can kind of tune these particles and what you can do right is you can take a particle and it doesn't have to be cadmium sulfide or cadmium selenide it could be whatever right and you can put molecules on here just like you do with the gold however what you can do then is you can put little docking sites that can then be um, used to hunt out cancerous cells. And so one thing that people have learned who have done cancer research is that uh, cancer cells overexpress folic acid in their membrane. And so you can take these nanoparticles and you can put little binding sites that prefer to bind to uh, folic acid. And they can actually go and they can hunt out and they can, in the body, attach to preferentially the cancerous cells as opposed to the healthy cells. And then what you can do is, since you know these nanoparticles absorb certain wavelengths of light, you can shine that light, especially in the case of skin cancer or cancer that's really close to the surface of the skin, that light can penetrate you and it can actually go in and when these materials absorb this light, they can build up a lot of heat and essentially cook and destroy the cancer cells causing minimal damage to the good cells that are around it. And that's really important because if you've ever known someone that undergoes has undergone uh, chemotherapy, chemotherapy, it, it can be really brutal. It can, it can have a lot of side effects in it because it's essentially poison, right? It, fortunately, it kills the cancerous cells hopefully more quickly than it kills your healthy cells, but it's still a very brutal, terrible process to have to go through. Um, and so, in this case, you can use nanotechnology as almost like a smart bomb or a smart missile to go in and target only the cancer cells and not everything. And that's a really exciting area of research that's going on right now. 
Another area would be using magnetic particles, right? If you've ever seen uh, ferrofluids, right? This is an example of a ferrofluid on this picture here. And here is the actual, uh, what these particles look like. These are about roughly 30 to 40 nanometers in size. And these are actually made of iron oxide. Actually, this is called the mineral magnetite, right? It's magnetic. And so here you can see that you can actually take these materials and make nanoparticles that are reactive to magnetic fields, which is really exciting. So imagine if you could, again, take a particle and make it magnetic. And so you can say, okay, here's my magnetite particle, and we're going to put, you know, some molecule on there. And let's say we put a ligand on this compound. And let's say that ligand has a preferential binding to say mercury. Well, what it could do then is it could bind to the mercury, right? And form a bond. And then once the magnetite, once these magnetic particles can, can bind to mercury, say in wastewater or in places you don't want mercury to be, you can then use a magnet to scoop it all out and collect it all, which is really an ingenious idea. NASA actually originally developed the ferrofluid to be a sort of a liquid, almost like a, a liquid um, O-ring or sealant um, for different materials, hoping to be able to put it where they need to put it using a magnetic field, which is really, really exciting. So you can just kind of begin to see that this is just the tip of the iceberg of the amazing applications. And again, that's more of the technology, but also the amazing science you can do to study the really crazy behavior of things that look like this and and behave in strange ways that both the bulk and the individual ions just don't behave that way all right so in this page i'd like to just mention briefly um, how do we have evidence for these nanoparticles and these nanostructures why should we believe that people have made such structures? Well, we have to have tools that can characterize them. And in your experience, you've used IR, infrared spectroscopy, right? You've used UV vis, you've, you've used uh, magnetic susceptibility, right? You've done a bunch of different things. Um, but nano, nanotech and nanoscience needs another toolkit because we need to be able to look at these really fine structures. And one of the most important tools that people use are electron microscopes. And electron microscopes are just amazing things. They were developed in the, first developed, say, in the 1930s and 40s. However, the World War um, sort of messed up the development because a lot of these were developed first in Germany. And when you have uh, bombers overhead, you don't tend to get much science done. Um, and so after the war, you really see a development of commercial instruments. And really in the 50s and in 60s, you really see just the widespread use of these kinds of tools. And today, even, um, you know, I have an electron microscope down in the basement of Hayes Hall, and maybe someday you can come take a look. Um, but there are two main kinds. The first kind is a scanning instrument, and the second kind is called a tunneling, and they share a lot in common. So you might ask, well, why would you want to use an electron microscope? Well, Many of you in biology especially have used light microscopes, right, to look at your flies and do your crosses and all that kind of stuff, or look at slides in your, your intro bio courses, right? And those are good for looking at things that, you know, like, you know, you can see with the naked eye, or maybe you, you want to look at structures that are really small. Um, but just like the, the, the x-ray crystallography, once you get materials that are too tiny to to visualize with visible light. And why is that? Because, you know, remember visible lights like 400 to 800 nanometers. And we're talking about things that are one to 100. So we've got to get smaller than visible light. And you could do it with x-rays, but that's a lot of work, um, a lot of danger. And so what we can do instead is we can use electrons, right? Remember, electrons can be treated both as a particle and a wave. And if you think about treating them as a wave, they have a wavelength. And that wavelength is really, really small. Not as small as x-rays, but pretty, pretty small. And so what you can do is you can focus electron beams and you can use them to generate images of materials that you want to look at. And let me just real quickly go through just two examples. So the first one is called an SEM, a scanning electron microscope. And that's really important. That's the kind of instrument I have down in Hayes Hall. And what you're going to do, you'll notice really quickly, is that you have an electron gun. Well, what is an electron gun? It's just something that generates electrons. It's, it's, it's really cool, but you know, you're not going to make a like a 
You're not going to go deer hunting with an electron gun, right? Because it doesn't work very well in the real world. Why is that? Because in the real world, there are lots of gases to get in the way of the electrons. You can't shoot an electron gun very far in, in, in ambient conditions. So what you have to do is you have to produce this under a vacuum. And then what you can do is you can generate the electrons and you can accelerate them down in a beam, down this column. So the electrons are going to shoot down here. And you use essentially... Um, a series of magnetic materials because again right you can use magnetic fields to focus them and ultimately what you do is you get them down to a point and then you hit your sample and here's your sample right in this case it's an ant and so I know ants are really big thing don't worry about it um, but here you can see um, an ant carrying a little microchip which is pretty badass I really like this picture um, but what happens is the electron beam will scan that's where you get the scanning from scan across the sample and electrons will scatter off of the sample. And depending on how many electrons scatter off of the sample, you get bright spots and dim spots, and you can image um, a variety of materials, uh, metals, nanoparticles, all kinds of amazing things, even small little, little um, biological samples. There's a lot to this, and I spent probably a year of my graduate work working with an electron microscope and 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 you just can't do it justice in the 10 minutes I'm talking to you about it but it's a really amazing instrument that allows you to focus and, and scan and develop images of very very small structures likewise with its cousin here the transmission electron microscope the TEM so it looks very similar the only main difference is that instead of your sample being down here your samples way up here check it out your samples up here and what you can do is you can say if I look at the top down view I'm gonna have nanoparticles right I'm gonna put them on a little stage because TM is really good at looking at how big nanoparticles are because what happens is the electron beam shoots through this and it gets focused just like in the previous example and what's gonna happen is if you've ever taken a flashlight and you put your hand in front of a flashlight you could imagine that the light is gonna go around your fingers and you'll get a shadow and that's essentially what you're gonna get with a TEM what you're gonna see is that the areas that have material with high electron density or high atomic weight so you're if you're making gold particles or silver particles those are gonna absorb a lot of electrons however the area around the metal is gonna be very light material maybe a carbon film that you've dumped your particles onto so the carbon film is much lighter in terms of its atomic weight which means it's not gonna absorb electrons as much so those electrons are gonna shoot through so the dark areas typically for a TEM micrograph are gonna show areas of high atomic weights and the light areas are gonna show areas of very low atomic weight. So it's a really good contrast technique. And so here you can see you're shooting the electron beam from your electron gun, right? Through your sample, right? All the way through your sample. And then you're gonna focus it again and you're gonna get a nice image here at the bottom. And here you can see uh, carbon is gonna be in this light area, right? Here you can see carbon here. There's gonna be some carbon here. Here's some carbon here and then here you're going to have gold and gold is going to be our dark particles right here and back in the day uh, when you read that nanoparticle paper that I, I have um, you had to actually take a TEM image and actually take a measurement device and measure each particle to get the diameter it was a lot of work luckily now you can write computer programs to do it for you but back back in my day you had to count count particles which is kind of crazy so these are two very distinct uh, but very similar at least in the terms of they use electrons to image materials uh, very very useful nanoscopic um, analysis techniques really really important all right if you look down here on the bottom of the page um, I'm going to show you two more of my favorite instruments and they deal with scanning probes and so um, what's going to happen here is on the first one, let's, let's kind of walk you through this. So don't get distracted by the pretty pictures here. This instrument is called the scanning tunneling microscope. And the way it's set up is basically you've got a, a tool here, a, a little ceramic, and it's called a piezo. And a piezo is basically a crystal that if you apply a current to it, it can enlarge or shrink based on how much current you put through it. And so what happens is you've got this little probe and this little probe is really, really sharp. In fact, it's so sharp, oftentimes the tip can be as sharp as one atom. 
That's, that's some amazing engineering, by the way. That's pretty cool. And what you do then is you then have a, a, a probe. This is your probe. It's attached to the piezo. And then you've got a sample. And let's say that your sample has just atomic structure or down here you've got little rough patches here. Well, you zoom in and there's a distance here. And this distance is how far away your tip is from the surface. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna get it really, 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 really close and you're doing this in vacuum, and electrons are gonna jump. They're gonna jump from uh, the probe to the surface, or vice versa, it doesn't really matter. And you'll get a current, because the electrons are gonna jump. You'll get a current, right? That's why you measure this in nanoamps, right? You can measure that. It's gonna be a really small current, but you can measure it. Now, what do you think happens if I take that tip and I move away from the surface? Well, the distance gets bigger, how do you think the efficiency of electrons to jump across that gap is gonna be? Well, it's gonna be a lot lower, which means your, your current will go down. Ah, oh, there you go. So now you can use the current to judge how far away the tip is from the surface. And so what you end up doing is you get a computer and you tell the computer, I want you to keep a certain distance from the tip to the, sur to the sample. And you're gonna say, okay, I wanna keep D constant. And so what happens then, is as the probe begins to slowly move or raster across the surface, if it starts to you know, get too close to the surface, the, volt, the amps will go up and up and up and the computer will say, oh no, no, and it will lift the probe off the surface. And if it begins to drift too far away from the surface, D gets too big, the, the, the amps will go down and the computer will say, oh no, 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 get, get closer together, get closer together. And it can control that piezo to maintain a constant distance. And by measuring the change in that ampage over time, it can map out a three dimensional surface for a sample. And it can do it with amazing precision. And if you look at this picture here, this is actually the surface of graphite. And here you can actually see the atomic hexagon pattern of graphite, which is pretty darn amazing. If you look at the scale bar here, you're talking about precision of half a nanometer, and it can get even better than that. But that's you're talking about imaging individual atoms effectively. I mean, if you think about it, right? If you look at this, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six atoms of carbon forming that chicken wire structure that we know as graphite. That's pretty amazing. The other thing that's really cool about TEM, uh, STM is that you can actually not only use the probe to um, image or determine the structure, you can use that probe to build things. Now granted, they have to be really, really small, but in 1981 is when this, this technique was really developed by the good folks at IBM they began to kind of show off. And so they were able to actually take a sample and cool it down to like, you know, four Kelvin because they don't want the atoms to move around due to surface energy. That can be a big problem. Um, and they actually were able to grab atoms with the probe and move them around. And this image that you see here, this image here is actually 35, I think it's argon atoms that they use to write, our, uh, write IBM, the name of their company, which is some major uh, nano tagging, if you will. It's it's pretty badass accomplishment for, especially in the 1980s. And so people got really excited about this. They started to think about, well, could you um, use this to build things atom by atom? And technically, I guess you could, but you'd have to build them at four Kelvin and building things atom by atom, if you can imagine, would take bloody forever. So not a very effective way of building things. So. Um, this shows some of the limitations, but the main thing is STM is a beautiful technique for imaging on the nanoscale. And then finally, it has its cousin, the AFM. This is the atomic force microscope. It works a little bit differently. One of the problems with STM up above is that you have to have conducting samples, right? Because you have to have electrons jumping and forming a, a nano current um, to be able to register that. Well. AFM is pretty cool. It's called atomic force microscopy. And what they do here is they have a sample and they have, again, a very sharp tip and that will move across a sample, right? And if, if you begin to move up and down as the sample is a little bit rough, what happens is you bounce the laser beam off the back of that probe and it hits a detector and it's a quad detector. And so that AFM, uh, if the cantilever goes up, 
the beam will go up and the computer will adjust. And in this case, the, the stage is a piezo and it can move up and down. And then you can have this guy move up and down or left and right. You don't typically want it to move left and right. You want it just to do the up and down motion. So that way the computer can register these uh, movements of that laser beam and it can register that as an up or down motion and it can image the topography of your surface in a way similar to the STM but for surfaces that probably don't have um, very good conductivity. And here you can see actually a little a little nano man, right? A little nano man. Essentially, it's a it's a little um, it's a little little dude made of of organic uh, carbon carbon bonds, which is kind of cool. He's like, oh no, kind of crazy guy there. Anyway, looks like he's running, kind of crazy. And then here you can see this is actually gold. Here is the surface of gold, and you can see the pattern, uh, which is pretty darn amazing. So again. I'm not going to have you memorize these because, of course, you can use your notes. But um, again, I think these are pretty darn cool instruments that are really useful for um, really thinking about how do you give evidence for the structure that you made, that you made the structures you claim to have made. And you'll see these kinds of, of um, analytical tools, these instruments used in, in various things various uh, research reports. The last thing I'm going to say, um, I'm kind of running and going long on time here, is you know, who are the who are the major players? Nanotechnology really kind of took off uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, a lot of government funding. Um, you know, the public got really excited about it. And, you know, it's it's done a lot of good. I mean, there are some applications due, uh, due to nanotechnology, a lot of new medicines and things like that. Um, you know, there's still a lot of room to, to go. Um, you know, there, there's still a lot of potential there that hasn't materialized and people are really worried about that. And there were really at the time two major schools of thought. You had, um, you had Drexler here um, on the, this is, this is Eric K. Drexler here. So this is Drexler. And he was kind of proposing this weird kind of mechanosynthesis model that I, you know, it's, it's very creative, but I'll leave it for you to judge. Um, the idea of if we could make machines out of molecules, right? So here you see this picture where he's essentially tried to take these tube molecules and make gears out of them. Now, nature, again, I'm not going to, to dog on it too much. I mean, nature and um, it has a lot of really cool ways that, you know, you can have uh, motion with molecular energy and that's a really cool thing but I think Drexler took it a little bit too far just in my personal opinion and he tried to come up with this idea of really making you know like pulleys and, and belt driven motors and things out of molecules which I just think is maybe just a little bit too far and wasn't the best way to go he has a, a famous book called Engines of Creation if you're interested in reading it it's, it's really kind of cool and I think pretty visionary but the science is, you know, it's it's interesting. It's just not my cup of tea. I don't think it's it's the way that has really panned out that well. Um, if you look at Rick Smalley there, so this is this is Professor Smalley. Um, Smalley actually won a Nobel Prize before he passed away um, for the discovery of. He was part of the group that discovered C60, right? The buckyball, the Buckminster Fullerene molecule, this soccer ball shaped molecule. And it's a really neat molecule with a lot of potential applications, but I would argue that its cousin, the carbon nanotube, um, which is essentially take graphite and wrap it around into a tube, and now you have a carbon nanotube. And carbon nanotubes have seen the potential be applied to a lot of different things, ranging from all these things below, like, I mean, check it out. I mean, you got um, memory, fuel storage, capacitors, you can take nanotubes and put them on the AFM and the STM microscopes I talked about. Um, display elements, just to name a few. Um, computing, all kinds of amazing things. Uh, the carbon nanotube is really cool. Uh, graphene, which we don't have time to talk about, is kind of the new hotness right now for carbon materials. So if you're interested, go look up graphene. It's a pretty amazing material. And I think ultimately Rick Smalley and, and that group of people really thought that these molecular materials that have these really unique and exotic properties was were really kind of the way to go and how to focus on this kind of stuff. And I think ultimately it's it's borne out that these 
molecular materials with really cool properties have driven uh, the applications that, that you'll see and that are continually continue to be um, uh, developed today. And then just a, a quick note, I think like anything that's exciting in science, it, it typically grabs the imagination of science fiction writers and you know science fiction uh, television and, and movie producers. I mean, I could I used to give a whole lecture on nanotechnology and in, in, in science fiction, but for right now, I mean, Michael Crichton's *Prey* was probably one of the first and most um, commonly referred to. It's an okay book. I mean, if you're into Crichton, it's it's pretty cool. There are, there are better ones, but it was one that I think is still probably the most popular. Um, and then for the longest time, there was this idea of you know. Uh, assemblers right the idea that what if a scientist were to make nanoscopic robots right that could um you know uh reproduce themselves and ultimately they could take things apart at the atomic level and they would take everything apart and just make more of themselves and this idea of the gray goo came about where what if these nanobots uh disassembled the world and just made more of them and the world was ultimately destroyed by the preponderance of this gray swarm of nanobot assembler replicating without any um, any check and so that's that's largely crazy um, uh, it's a fun fiction device but you know um, things just don't quite work that way uh, and, and I don't think that's something you're gonna have to really worry about in this day and age we have plenty to worry about as it is but um, the idea of little robots um, infecting you to turn you into a Borg or on the other hand, making little robots that can cure cancer are just not not really grounded in, in how things work. So um, really, instead of making little robots and little machines, uh, now granted, there are uh, micro um, electromechanical systems, MIMS, uh, which are very useful, and you can check those out, but they're not little robots that are going to swim inside your veins and things like that. That's just not going to probably happen. Um, but the idea of using molecules and using materials that have unique properties to do things like fight cancer or to give you faster computers, that's where it's really at right now. And I leave it to your generation to take things in a new directions and really make things, um, you know, uh, live up to the potential that nanotech has. So there's still lots of contributions to be made. And uh, nanotech, I hope I've shared a little bit of my passion. Again, I need to kind of cut this off now. I wish I could have done like 10 more pages of nanotech, but you would have been really bored probably by then. But anyway, um, work hard. Uh, nanotech, like I said, will probably not be on the exam or something really, really small. Um, but the idea here is that nanotech combines the idea of materials and you know fundamentals of the periodic table, but takes it to a realm where the rules are totally different and there's lots of contributions to be made and a lot of neat investigations to be had. So I hope you're kind of excited by Nanotech. Maybe you are, maybe you're not, but um, I am and I hope I shared that with you. So take care, don't forget, exam on Wednesday, study hard, uh, review session uh, on Monday afternoon and I'll catch you later.